Oregon. Yeah, America's team. Per me. We got a half hour into this thing before we talk about the Oregon Ducks. The least we can do is at least act somewhat impartial <laughs> when we're doing a Pac-12 Why? North preview. I am who I am. You are who you are. We are fans first. Yeah. Oregon Ducks new coach, Dan Lanning. A lot of talent. You mentioned the offensive line in a really good spot. Most of the two deep back, with the exception of like one guy who started last year. Mm-hmm. Um, bring over Bo Nix. That was a story that we talked about a lot here in the offseason. Dan Lanning, not a ton of familiarity with that corner of the country, but obviously comes with great acclaim from Georgia's previous stops, right? This is a guy who was coaching, helping coach a historic defense and won a national championship. So if nothing else, proximity to great success, high heights on the college football side is there with this new enthusiastic young college football mind. Where are you at? Are you as enthusiastic as Dan Lanning? Yes. The program. Okay. That's what he calls it. The program is in a he's good one spot. Of them, huh? Yeah, program. program. Uh, and it's great. I'm I'm a fan of Lanning. I think he's done all of the right things early on in his tenure in Eugene. Hope it lasts for a long time if he's successful because you know the, the returns on the recruiting trail seem strong. The the vibe in the program, from what I've heard, heard seems pretty strong. So I'm hopeful. Yeah, I mean, look, you, we can we can board the underthink express and say, yeah, but it's Bo Nix, right? That's the basic way to underthink the Oregon preview. That offensive line, receiver, running back, especially with what you know they added depth wise in the portal. You know, they added a ton of depth on defense up front. You know, linebacker, should they be healthy finally at linebacker, has two all American caliber, at least all conference caliber linebackers. They added depth and talent in the secondary with I mentioned Christian Gonzalez, the Colorado transfer, who I think has higher level NFL draft uh prospects. So there's a lot to really, really like, you know, but the turnover between coaches and the way things ended last year with getting demolished by Utah and then losing the way that they did. They were quite thin against Oklahoma, but Oklahoma was without their head coach as well uh, and brought in a, a current XFL, I believe. Is that what Bob Stoops is <laughs> the next part of his career? So he's in alternate leagues, alternate professional leagues right now. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, the, the transfers that left, the way that the recruiting class, you know, it fell apart, but then Lanning was able to, to bring in some guys back into the fold. It, it left a weird taste, I think, in a lot of fans' mouth in Eugene or people who root for Oregon. But, again, I'm using the word upside. I'm using the word star power. It's at every position group. Like, this is a deep, talented team. And so now it's Dan Lanning, Kenny Dillingham, first-time offensive coordinator who's fully calling the plays, doing their part to say... You see that storefront that everybody takes a shot at that seems cursed? Well, we're taking a shot with <laughs> the corner of Bo and Nix. That's the question. That is the fair question because everything around him on offense sort of sets him up to succeed. And the defense is as talented, if not more talented, than any in the conference. I don't know if they're the best defense, but the the depth at every position seems to be in a really impressive place. So it's limiting Bo Nix mistakes and brain fart plays and getting 72% out of good Bo Nix as opposed to 51, 44, 38, as we've seen in years past. The case would be, okay, he's playing against worse defenses. Um, He has, you know, perhaps a more stable environment. You know, Auburn is a lot of really good things, but not necessarily stable behind the scenes and the expectations that he had. So there's not a lot of, holes to poke now I think the defensive scheme will be really interesting because you're marrying Lanning and Kirby Smart and what they were able to do at Georgia you have Tosh Lupoi and what he was able to do at Cal and Alabama impressively and then Matt Polidge who comes in from Baylor is coaching the secondaries as a co-coordinator so you got like the Aranda seasoning in there so there's a lot of interesting cooks in this kitchen on defense and nobody has a full concept of what they're going to do on offense beyond look to Mike Norvell and the better of what he and Dillingham were able to do at Memphis, which is a lot of like really good running and decent quarterback play. So there's just yeah, I mean, a lot of mystery I, not, schematically. Yeah, I mean, we don't know exactly what it's going to look like. We can take some cues, though, from what Kenny Dillingham has been around and part of at previous stops. And one of the things, if you read his bio, if you listen to what people have to say about him, he was adaptable. He was adaptable to the personnel. If it was personnel that would benefit from going more run heavy, he could do that. If he had a dual threat quarterback, he knew how to work with that at Florida State or even a pocket passer. He's worked with that as well. So 
I don't know if Kenny Dillingham is so much defined by one system as he is just the general genre, the theme of right. being adaptable and working with what with what he's got on hand. Yeah, and having the experience, you know, going both ways that Kenny Dillingham has with Bo Nix and vice versa, hopefully that's worthwhile that they're able to speak a similar language and like, okay, this we're going to incorporate some of the things that worked well for you in Gus's system at Auburn and uh, we're going to adapt to the players that we have here to make it our own. That's the upshot. That's, you know, that's the hope if you're an Oregon fan. Now, they open against Georgia. <laughs> So things get real very quickly. And if you look if at you're going to get Georgia, get them week one, though, I suppose so. If there's still some sort of hangover mode, but I don't know. I don't think excellent programs and excellent teams fall victim to hangover mode against what I still think is a pretty top flight program in Oregon. So, yes, get them early before they're truly in a rhythm. But I don't know. There's so much back in terms of coaching with Georgia and so many guys, and we talked about this on the SEC preview, who actually played a ton on that defense, yeah. even though the guys who got drafted sort of received the, the majority of the attention. But yeah, I suppose so. It's in what the Mercedes Benz, uh, whatever they're calling it, Mercedes Benz field. Um, and so I don't know, maybe it's weird and cavernous, but Georgia's more experienced at this point playing in a place like that. So after the Georgia game, it's not a bad schedule. That's just a tough way to begin the season. Um, so they they open it. It's kind of weird, though. They have Eastern Washington, always dangerous, um, and BYU, which returns a, a good amount. And we'll talk about them at another point. Um, but they're at Wazoo, which is never easy, easy. They get UCLA at home, which is nice. And they finish with Washington and Utah in Eugene before, I don't know what we're calling it, the Platypus Cup um, yep. in, in Corvallis, which I still think it, the Oregon State offense is going to be pretty good. Um, so all things considered. I don't know. You get past that Georgia game, and like, there's no expectation that Oregon beat Georgia. I don't know what the line is at the time uh, we're recording this, but I assume double digits. Yes, I will. I will check, check that out. Yeah, yeah, check as I I yodel on. Uh, yeah, if Bo Nix, once again, if I'm going to say it with with Cam Ward, uh, if Bo Nix is a BB plus quarterback, they should be in that conversation to win double digit games in year one, because there there are too many pieces for them not to be that in that. In that uh, in that space, given if they're able to stay healthy on both sides of the ball, which is always a big if, yeah, they they should be a ten and two type program. I'm seeing eighteen points right now. Yeah, that's many points. That is a dozen and a half, and a half 18, points. Depends where you look. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I I mean, look, I, you can tell me anything, and I'm like, I could see how Oregon loses this game by eighteen points. I've watched Oregon's presumed starting quarterback play against Georgia, and so I get it. Eight and a half is the over under. Feels low to me. What is the over under? Eight and a half. Eight and a half wins. I would probably take the over. It's hard for me to see. Again, we talk about the potential catastrophic defenses on Pac 12 teams' schedule. And I, or I think Oregon's in a good place. Now, could they drop the BYU game? Unlikely. But there are, you know, versions of this universe in which it happens. Yeah. So, no, I think they're in a good place. Utah's going to be incredibly tough, but they miss what? They miss USC, right, in the regular season schedule, which is nice. I think they're going to be good. I don't think they're going to be great, but I think they're going to be good. And, yeah, if it's not Bo Nix, it's likely going to be Ty Thompson, the former highly regarded blue chip quarterback who is going to be a, I think, a redshirt freshman this year. So, we'll see. Do you have any Oregon Let's... thoughts, concerns? Upshots? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm concerned about Dan Lanning being a first time head coach. Sure, but I'm not. I'm not. But that's a common theme, especially going into 2022. There are so many big schools that have new new coaches that uh, first time head coaches that it, it's fair to make that type of <laughs> that type of concern public. Um, no, I mean, look, I'm I'm concerned about that, but I feel like there's so much talent on this roster. I really like the fact that their offensive line's in such a good spot. It's it's not something that enough people talk about, and a lot of people still talk about it. But it all starts up front, as the wise prophet <laughs> David Pollock once said. Davidius Pollockus, yeah. Yeah, and, and I think it's true, especially on the Oregon side. They've got good depth up front. They've got good talent up front. They only lose one guy off too deep. And so if that's your starting point, you could do a lot worse than that. What the offense looks like remains to be seen. I'm not a huge Bo Nix fan. You could definitely do worse than Bo Nix, though. Bo Nick, but you can do a lot with him. Yeah. And, and so we'll we'll see what that ends up looking like 
on Labor Day weekend against Georgia. But um, all things considered, especially given the nature of the schedule, playing a lot of Pac-12 teams, yep. Oregon's at a really good spot. Oregon's going to win the North, Dan. They're going to win the North. And I don't know if they end up, I, I'm assuming they'll end up playing Utah. I'm pretty high on Utah. We'll talk about that next episode. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, they're in a really good spot. It's a great landing spot for Dan Lanning. There, by the way, to tickle your Seinfeld and George Costanza portion of your brain, Oregon's sort of wild card slot back speed guy who they're going to move all over the place like a, a diet D'Anthony. His name is Seven. Seven. Just like George Costanza's dream name for his future son, Seven McGee. Seven. Good name. Seven McGee. Will be yeah. um, occupying that role. 